and I quote, The new NASA, which actually could choose the first astronauts of the Western world, those destined to be among the world's first legally designated envoys of mankind. Now note what they say here, and remember these are lawyers talking. Destined to be among the world's first legally designated envoys of mankind. Which indicates there was someone who were performing this function illegally. NASA was to carry out a feat that through the millennia had inflamed the imagination of humankind to break the surly bonds of Earth. NASA thus had a decisive voice in determining just how and by whom those surly bonds would be broken and in some sense NASA would become the arbiter of Olympus. Yet despite its shiny new title, it was the legatee and recipient of many old traits and trends. First, and perhaps most hopeful, was President Eisenhower's unbending insistence that the space effort have a rigorously civilian character with a primary emphasis on original research, development, and exploration. This was clearly reflected in the 1958 National Aeronautics and Space Act. This act, the new NASA charter, made dissemination of information a duty of the agency, and despite a grant of considerable authority, the purview of the agency was specifically limited to those developments necessary for research and exploration. To insulate the program from what Eisenhower feared would be perceptions of involvement with the military-industrial complex, the Space Act, in its declaration of policy, specified that NASA was to be responsible primarily for research and development associated with aeronautical and space activities, except, except, except for those activities peculiar to or primarily associated with defense. It was also required that the administrator of NASA be a civilian. In several respects, the United States took a courageous step in July 1958 when President Eisenhower signed the Space Act, which charged the Space Agency of the United States government to lead a strictly civilian, peaceful exploration of space for the benefit of all mankind. These were not the words of parochial nationalism and socio-biological territoriality. They were not the words of conquest. They were precisely the words that would turn up almost ten years later in the unique Outer Space Treaty of 1967, sometimes affectionately referred to by practitioners of space law as the Mother Treaty, which means there are many other treaties. The Mother has children. The United States Space Act seemed to strike an unorthodox and elevated philosophical and political posture usually witnessed only in extraordinary times. NASA's entire legal and organizational environment was formulated to cultivate a broad spectrum of constituencies for its programs, even if those constituencies were comparatively small. NASA was deliberately connected to other important constituencies outside the President's office and cabinet integrated high-level consideration of space policy and an institutional memory, moreover, were assured by the creation in the Space Act of a broadly based National Aeronautics and Space Council in the Executive Office of the President. Still, the old dual military-civilian program remained, and you don't hear anything about that. Significant early acquisitions of NASA included the Vanguard program of the Navy, the Lunar Probe Project of the Air Force, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory of California Institute of Technology, and the five Army Satellite Projects at the prestigious Army Ballistic Missile Agency at Huntsville, Alabama. The continuing nature of this military-industrial-civilian symbiosis, despite the organizational philosophy, an extraterritorial nature of the new NASA was once again apparent in the actions and words of President Eisenhower. Although he insisted in a news conference on 4 November 1959 that non-military space exploration was a sort of doctrine in America, he had laid the groundwork in 1958 for the new 
second version of the dual space program. Six months before the creation of NASA in February 1958, the Congress had passed the administration's bill creating the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA, which had its own director of space. The next month, pending the formation of NASA, the President gave his approval to the plan advanced by DARPA, making it, in a real sense, the first United States Space Agency. When NASA was finally formed, the accompanying Space Council was directed to provide a civilian military liaison committee composed of an equal number of representatives from the military department and NASA, which meant that the military predominated over civilians on the committee three to one. Also, despite the requirement that the administrator of NASA be a civilian, the Space Act did not require NASA to be managed by civilians in the ranks. NASA was heavily staffed at high levels with retired or borrowed military personnel. In the May 1958 Congressional hearings on the Space Act, DARPA Administrator Roy Johnson stated the Eisenhower administration's approved position on the proposed space legislation and his testimony included this statement, quote, the legislation setting up a civilian group should not be so worded that it may be construed to mean that the military uses of space are to be limited by a civilian agency. For example, if Department of Defense decides that it is militarily desirable to program for putting man into space, it should not have to justify this activity to this civilian agency. The NASA Authorization Act should be amended to provide that insofar as such space activities may be peculiar to or primarily associated with weapon systems or military operations, in the case of which activity the Department of Defense will be responsible. So it is interesting to note that even the limitation of NASA by its charter purely to be peaceful, non-military activities was not motivated strictly by altruism. It was as much to keep net. One more time to you so that you will understand truly what I'm telling you. Even the limitation of NASA by its charter purely to peaceful, non-military activities was not motivated strictly by altruism. It was as much to keep NASA out of the military's business as it was to keep the military out of NASA's business. The fact that peaceful research and development by NASA also fulfilled non-hostile military needs simply made it easier for the civilian effort in space undertaken hand in glove with the military and for the military to conduct space exploration in secret. The Space Act made the intent of the relationship quite clear when it indicated that a primary objective in establishing NASA was to achieve, quote, the most effective utilization of the scientific and engineering resources of the United States with close cooperation among all interested agencies in order to avoid unnecessary duplication of effort, facilities, and equipment." End quote. Still though, the intent may not really have been to accomplish a full division of efforts. A striking degree of division remained. It was undeniable that an open civilian program was created for the exploration and exploitation of space on an internationally cooperative basis for the benefit of all mankind with accompanying man in space publicity hype and space extravaganzas that convinced most of the United States population as well as most of the world that it was the only United States program. It was not. There was also a secret commitment to a secret space program, the highest priority having been given to space research with a military application, and there was significant military involvement and interest in the new civilian space program as well. <laughs>